Hi, and welcome to Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva, and we have a real treat today. We have a, uh, a multi-talented uh, uh, person joining us today, and uh, we will tell you uh, all about her and uh, uh, her new endeavors. Uh, Mary McDonough welcomes readers back to the small town of Oliver's Well, Virginia, in a story of holiday and homecoming as three siblings gather for a Christmas that brings unexpected gifts. And uh, here's, here's a, a copy of the book right here. Definitely he's got what appears to be a Christmas, uh, Christmas theme, say that three times. And also um, the first in what I believe was a series, and Mary will explain this as we go along, is also uh, her first uh, fictional uh, uh, novel called One Year. So uh, we welcome, we know her, we love her, Actress, uh, author, advocate, Mary McDonough. Thanks, Mary, for joining us. How are you? I am good. How are you? Excellent. Thanks for having me. A pleasure. Thank you for making time. Um, the series that you, you are writing now, am I correct that it is a, a uh, loosely kind of series of books set in this fictional town? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's set in a town called Oliver's Well, which is a small town in Virginia. And um, the first one, one year, takes place in one year of um, this Irish American Catholic family's lives. And it deals with generations of women with a strong matriarch trying to deal with her, <laughs> so particularly daughters in law. And this one is the second in the series. And it does have a Christmas theme. You're right about that, Larry. And it is, yeah, the house on Honeysuckle Lane. So Honeysuckle Lane is the street that both of the families live on. So there are some crossover characters from the first book, and this one has some siblings that have to come together, and they do it at Christmas time, but they have to kind of wrap up their parents' estate. So I, I was correct. I did notice I hadn't read the first one, but I did read the, the current uh, uh, release, and I said, why am I thinking that some of these characters, even if they were just referenced, I said, so it's kind of a, uh, if you had to say, what, what's the population of, of Oliver's Well? Uh, uh, oh, that's a really good, that's a really, I'm going to say like. Like 12,000, uh, 15,000, or maybe. No, uh, I was going to say much smaller. So, I was going to say like maybe four or five. Okay, so a, a, a probably uh, from my limited uh, time spent in Virginia, probably one of many small towns. Now, another thing. Where was the inspiration for the um, uh, using Virginia? Now, I'm going to say that there might have been a Walton's connection there, and, and you tell me, and I'll tell you why I think that. Um, well, um, they always say, write what you know. So I've spent a lot of time in Virginia, and um, I love all the small towns there. And, I, and, so, and having gone back there, because there is a very small town called Schuyler, Virginia, which is where the Walton, Earl Hamner, the real Waltons are based, the go. Hamner family is from Schuyler. And I also have spent some time in another small town that has a historical society, which is not in Virginia. But I have actually um, based a lot of Oliver's Well based on that town. So, because I knew Earl, who we lost in 2016, was from that that state, or I believe. Uh, so I thought, okay, well, she obviously is maybe drawing a connection. Uh, uh, to get off my, my list of questions, because uh, his name came up, uh, was he an inspiration, or did were you even maybe with the first book or the original concept? Uh, did you ever run any of this by him, maybe to get his opinion? I, I didn't, actually, but I did on my first book. So my first book is a memoir called Lessons from the Mountain, What I Learned right. from Aaron Walton. And Earl wrote the foreword for it. And he um, he's definitely an inspiration for Oliver's Well novels in the series there as well. Um, because, you know, I wouldn't have spent so much time in Virginia if it wasn't for him and for Schuyler and the Waltons. And also, he was just an inspiration as far as being such a great writer and such a wonderful human being. But when I went to him, when I wrote, the memoir is based on my life. And, and the, during the Walton times, my own Irish Catholic family, and then beyond. And it was funny, I went to him and I asked him to write the foreword for the book, and he said, I don't know, well, you know, Mary Beth, if you send it to me, I'm gonna have to tell you I won't write it unless I actually like the book. Wow, there you <laughs> so go. So I was really nervous. 
There you go, boy. Tough love, huh? <laughs> Yeah, and so I, so I was waiting on pins and needles when I sent it to him. And he came back and he gave me some incredibly wonderful advice. And um, and he said, I like it. I'm going to write the foreword. So I was incredibly honored and feel so blessed not only to have had him in my life, but to have him to be part of it, of Lessons from the Mountain. There you go. So I was on the right track. I said, you know, Earl's influence or spirit or whatever. I, at that point, of course, he was still alive when the first and, and the second book was being written. I said, I've got, I've got to ask. Another thing, and these are just thoughts that are running through based on the answers you're giving me. Uh, a few years ago, I thought I saw a, I want to say a special. I don't think it was any kind of a short-term series. Did you do a thing in Earl's Neck of the Woods with uh, the late John Ritter? Like it was, um, it was a... Oh, my gosh, yeah, that was a really long time like, ago. So I, I was a, um, a special correspondent for Entertainment Tonight. Okay. And I brought John Ritter back to the Walton House for sort of a mini reunion, but a look back on the show. And yeah, yeah that was yeah. a while ago. Well, it, it, it's uh, not not to plug them, but it's I think I saw it via YouTube, and I thought it was actually kind of like a, you know, like true Hollywood stories type of thing. And I didn't remember, you know, uh, but I remember you were there and you were quite involved. And then of course John at that point had uh, when I saw it had already passed. Uh, uh, much too soon, and I just thought, wow, what a cool, uh, cool concept here. And I'm thinking, you know, uh, all this exposure, of course, now is is paying dividends with with your books. Uh, did you ever think of yourself that you were someday going to become a writer? Not like Earl, you know, yeah. he was such an inspiration because he was so great. But I think through osmosis, I picked up, you know, with Rod and Rod Peterson and, and Claire Whitaker and all the great writers on our show. And Ellen Corby wrote. And so I think just, you know, I picked it up that way. But I always wrote, even before I started the show, I wrote plays and put them on in our, at my school and in the backyard. And I, I wrote all the time. So I, I never really thought that that would be my career. <laughs> but, you know, and it is just one of my careers. As, I, as I've learned in life, sometimes the hard way, never say never. You know, you're saying, oh, that'll exactly. never happen. This, uh, and, and, and lo and behold... Uh, Aaron Walton, folks, uh, Mary McDonough joining us here on Studio 411. Mary is very elusive. She's so busy that she is literally, you have to almost tackle her to get her on, but uh, hard work and perseverance. And uh, we thank also Karen Orbach from uh, uh, Kensington. Am I pronouncing Kensington Books? Uh, which uh, is put, yeah. actually put, has put out all three of your books. I didn't realize the memoir was also from uh, Kensington. It is. Kensington doesn't do a lot of memoirs, so I was yeah. really fortunate to have um, a hero there in John Sugmilio. And um, he loved the book and he loved the Waltons, and so he was a champion for it. And then they came to me and said, do you think you could write, you know, we'd love to do a couple of um, novels. And I thought, wow, okay. So I've written screenplays and I can adapt something and learn a lot and fast. And he's like, oh, no, no, it's all good. But then we, you know, so we came to terms like, what would they be like? And, and you know, Kensington does a lot of women's fiction. Yes, and, exactly. and I said, well, I don't, you know, write some of that. I'm not going to write historical fiction. But I, you know, but I, you know, as a life coach and someone who does a lot of public speaking, I wanted the books to be about topics that I cared about. And I, I there's a through line about women and people getting along and communication and about family. And that family isn't necessarily always your blood, but it's, all the people that you love and who are your community. And so they were very keen on that. So it worked out really well. And, you know, having, you know, had a lot of really strong women in my life for one year, the Mary Bernadette character, it doesn't matter. She's, you know, she's a combination of a lot of different women. And I've had people tell me like, oh, wait a minute, my mother-in-law is just like her and we're Jewish. Oh, we're Italian. I have, a, I know her. So, it, like you know, anybody who's had a strong woman who's very dominant in the family, it doesn't matter what to culture. Totally, you're from. Uh, totally transcends uh, both cultural, ethnic, uh, you know, uh, parameters. Uh, exactly, and, and I, exactly. And I, a strong woman is a strong woman, that's and they right. run families with an iron fist. Sometimes it doesn't matter where they're from. And a mediocre guy, well, enough said. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, uh, let's see. What was the um, uh, in, in the book, uh, at the beginning, you dedicated the book to, uh, all, quote, all the uh, orphans out there. Uh, uh, tell me a little bit about what, what 
that meant and what inspired that uh, that comment. So my mom used to call anybody who had lost both of their parents, whether it was from birth or an accident or whether through, you know, just age um, or whether they were orphaned. She always used to say, oh, so-and-so is an orphan now. And in the house on Honeysuckle Lane, the kids are kind of orphans now, even though they're adults. And I, when my mom died, because my dad died when I was 16, so when my mom died years later, um, I felt like I was an orphan, just like my mom had always said. So I think a lot of people in the sandwich generation were going through a time where we lose our parents and we need to be responsible for them, whether it's their health later in life or whether it's going through all of the stuff they left behind. And this is a story, and I've done it. I've done it. So this is a story about siblings and the different kinds of ways they reconcile losing their parents and going back to dealing with who they were and what their place is in the family. And also, um, it's a lot about attachment, like the things that we get attached to, whether it's the emotional baggage or whether it's the, that teapot that we, that we always thought we would get or, you know, whatever it is, so, so yeah. See, I, I can just focus the camera on Mary because my next question was, quote, the book main theme, would you say, is about attachment, Mary? So, so, oh, yeah, good, yeah. So, so, and, and I tell you this, and I always say this, and people are like, why do you say that? Because, you know, but it's true. I am not a fiction reader by, by habit. I am a nonfiction person, so I always, uh, the, lately with the program, uh, I've been finding myself uh, happily uh, good experiences uh, with several guests off and on when it's not music or sports or po politics, whatever, having uh, fictional authors. So then I'm like, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm going to have to, like, go through this. And, and then, you know, you just have to kind of dive in and just kind of let it let it take you away, you know, and use your imagination. Whereas I'm more about, oh, you know, the Battle of 1812 and, and right. Appomattox and civil rights and, you know, Martin Luther King and all that stuff. So it's, you know, it's sometimes a little bit of a transition for me. The, the books as a whole, um, both age group and, and um, kind of niche, where would you say these fit in? Is it, it's not young adult fiction, it's more like uh, women's lit literature, or what would you call it? Yeah, a little bit, like women, women's literature, and I would say, you know, the youngest character in a one year is in her 20s, and so it's about these, these women who marry into this family, and they love these men, but they have a hard time dealing with this, this woman, who's the mother-in-law, and then also the grandmother-in-law, and so, so Alexis is in her 20s and she's madly in love with this guy but didn't realize what she was getting into with this family where there's a lot of expectation and holidays are done and so she goes through her learning curve and trying to deal with her and then you know people in their 40s and then you know Mary Bernadette is in her 70s so it's it's three generations of women and I find that that is an interesting through line as well. You know, what traditions do you learn and pass down and what do you just buck? And how do you find your place in a very strong family? Sure. Do you find, and as reading this book, and again, uh, uh, I did not necessarily go through this myself, but I've heard horror stories and people that I've known. When, when someone passes, all of a sudden, I don't want to use the word vultures, but all of a sudden everyone comes out because they're looking for stuff, if that makes sense. You know, it's like kind of where were you in when this one needed you or at least yeah. have the decency to if someone passes and you were estranged from that person, at least, you know, don't don't show up and act like you care, you know, and and. So, you know, I, I there's some of that, that in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's that whole attachment. And there's also that entitlement. And there's also, you know, dealing with the loss and also, you know, you don't have parents anymore. You're an orphan. So who, how do you, how do you deal with the memory of your parents and where you are in the, in the family as right. well? So there are people who feel, I had a, I had a woman tell me a really, really lovely story when I told her I was writing this book and she said, oh my gosh, you have to write this book because everybody goes through this. I mean, she said, you know, we had this situation where there was this item and 
I remember very specifically that my mother gave it to me. And when we all went to like divide things up, the sister said, oh, no, that was, that's mine. She gave that to me a long time ago. That was always been mine. I was there when she bought it, and that, that, which is actually on the back of it, there was a note that actually said that it was for the other sister because she was because the other sister was there when she bought it. But the little sister had remembered hearing the story and just figured it was her. Yeah. You know, and grief does such horrible things to people sometimes. And, and trying to, you know, one of the characters in the house on Honeysuckle Lane is sort of like a very like guru's, you know, spiritual person like, oh, you know, no attachment for her. She, you know, obsessively quotes the Buddha and Rumi and, you know, and suddenly she finds herself at one point very attached to something and, and it's sort of not her thing. And so she thinks, wait a minute, what is this about? Yeah, because again, we as human beings, I hope so, uh, are constantly in a state of learning flux, as I call it, where, you know, we don't all know everything. If we do, then, you know, turn the lights out and let's call it a day, you know what I mean? Or like <laughs> I was saying to so many people, let's say, well, what am I going to do when I retire? Oh, I'm going to do nothing but kick back. I'm like, then, you know, here's a shovel, start digging the hole, because if you think you're going to retire at 60, 62, 66 and eight months, all of a sudden, but, you know, you have to have plans on what you want to do. And, but all these things, that you talked about and I just mentioned, you know, are all that unknown. What we don't know, we think we do at 20, what it is like at yeah. 40. And you and I, because we're both from those kind of Eisenhower Kennedy babies, uh, you know, there is no way. As, as savvy as I thought I was, and I'm sure being in the business you were in, oh, you know, you know, our stuff doesn't stink, you know, everything's good. And meanwhile, you know what, you look back now and say, wow, you know. Yeah. It probably was savvier than some of your contemporaries, but in reality, you, there's no way that you could know what, you know, what the, uh, the parents, the Reynolds parents were going through or uh, some of the other characters or what Earl or, you know, Ralph Wade, some of your co-stars. Again, they, they, they all have good points and they had their problems, but you, unless you're in their shoes, you can't fully uh, appreciate what they, uh, what they go through. Yeah, it's true, ideas. and I think I, some of the mystery about House on Honeysuckle Lane is that the kids actually start to learn some things about their parents that they didn't know. Exactly. And I know that that was true with my mom when I found things she had written, and you know I was responsible to kind of pull everything together in the final taxes, and it's just something that you don't think you're ever going to do with your parents. I mean, you think, I will be there, and that, but you just don't think, oh, I have to do paperwork? I have to find things to put it together. So, um, and while you're going through the grief and the loss at the same time, and it hits everybody in a different way, and people respond, and, and then when you find out things that make your parent a little bit more human, and, you know, you might not want to acknowledge that they might have made some mistakes or had, a, you know, misjudgment because you put them on a pedestal and think, oh, gosh, you know they were everything yeah. or and then they be, you know it's very it's very interesting to see and what to have to go through what people have left behind and to try and sift through what that means to you and to the rest of your family yeah exactly mary mcdonough actress author advocate uh, the new book uh, the house on honeysuckle lane kensington uh, books uh website for more information www.marymcdonough.com um, uh, where was I going with this? I, uh, my, my head is exploding. I have so much to cover with Mary before she cooks dinner. So, you know, uh, <laughs> what's the best thing about being a writer? Oh, it's rewarding when someone, when you touch someone's life, you know, they always say if, if you have touched one person or made one person think, um, then, all, you know, your life is about val is valid. So having had people come and say, oh my gosh, this really helped me, or that really touched me, or I was just able to lose myself in this story. I could so relate to this character. Um, that's very rewarding. So that's just really fun. Uh -huh. The alone time, and that that's part of it is very isolating, but, um, and getting, but I'm, you know, I'm an extrovert a little bit. So getting out there and meeting people at, at book festivals and, and book signings is really fun. And what, uh, what advice do you have for uh, young, aspiring writers? <sighs> Write a thousand words a day. 
<laughs> now, what what is your regimen? Like uh, a guest I had recently, and and many others that I've talked to, uh, both on and off this program. Uh, again, uh, you know, five to noon, or you know, eight to three. In other words, they they treat it almost like it's kind of a their their shift job. You know, what I'm saying, yeah. and kind of like everything's off. Don't bother me. Don't call me. You know, somebody better walk the dog because I'm busy. Or like, for instance, where you are in your home studio there, kind of like shut the door and, and you know, I'm in my little tranquility there. Do you find that? or It cha has changed for me over time. I know people who unplug phones and lock themselves in closets. I have not had to do that yet. Um, yeah, it's, it depends. Like when I was raising my kids and I had to, you know, it's like find time any any time you can. So I never had a set schedule. I would like to do morning, you know, after school drop off and before pick up. So you're talking, you know, 8 to 2.30 and then later on, you know. But to me, it's like on airplanes. I ride on airplanes because you finally get some alone time. Um, any time you can, just write. And every, and then I use my phone a lot now. I wake up in the middle of the night and I'll think of, oh my gosh, this is how, this is how this happens. And I just hit note and I talk <laughs> into it and then I go back to sleep. It's like that commercial where the wife goes, "Who are you talking to?" And it turns out he's talking to an insurance male. But again, in Mary's <laughs> case, she's just talking to herself. So, a husband, the, myself, husband can just right, roll so. over and go back to sleep. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, but, you know it, and it doesn't have to be so specific as long as you can just get it done. And sometimes I will go out. Um, I live in Denver now and there's this beautiful botanic garden. So when the water lilies were in bloom, I went and just sat there and looked at the water lilies. And then I wrote my next project has something to do with water lilies in France and stuff. So it was very inspiring. So wow. go wherever you have an, to. An international flavor coming up from Mary McDonough, France. There we go. Yes. Um, Pictures on the wall. Pictures <laughs> everywhere. Set, set a mood, you know, something on yep. the ceiling there. Uh, the book's main characters, of course, as you mentioned, siblings, uh, Andy, Emma, and Daniel Reynolds. Um, again, uh, each one kind of struck me a certain way. You know, Daniel, again, without giving away too much of the plot, uh, seemed like almost overwhelmed by, you know, having to be thrust into being kind of the caretaker, as you mentioned, of the parents. Mm -hmm. The father had passed, mother had passed within a year or so of this, this story kind of taking place. Um, and the kind of the bohemian one of the, you yeah. know, uh, uh, what would you say? She's an author in her own right, a writer. Yeah. yeah sort of new agey guruish, you know, think um, uh, like Brene Brown, uh, okay. Liz Gilbert, you know, that sort of people yeah. who are out there in sort of, you know, a non-traditional way of dealing with life and something and, a little bit more progressive. And as, as people will, will see when they read the book, again, it's the kind of that thing where it's just very non-traditional, that particular character. And then you've got uh, uh, Emma. Is Emma the youngest of the three? Um, Daniel is. Oh, Daniel is. Oh, no wonder he's stressed. Okay, so Emma, yeah. Emma's the middle one, if I recall. And yes. she certainly seems like, you know, she's got herself together, although she's kind of in a so-so relationship, you know, and then sometimes uh, we're in relationships for maybe the wrong reasons and uh, uh, turn down a chance, what, to work for her father's business. And, mm -hmm. and then all sorts of things happen. But again, it's... Yeah, uh, the family history comes in. And I think when you lose your parents, you really... There is a mortality thing there, too. And you actually look at your life and you look at what you went. You process the stuff you went through as your parent with your parents and where you fell in the family. And she's the middle child. I'm the middle child. And on both show, in the Waltons and here. Mm -hmm. So she... And then you start to take stock and think, well, wait, hey, what really matters to me? What matters to me in life? And I think when you lose your parents, you really look back at your life and your family. And that's certainly what she does. Do you buy into that, that there is kind of a... We'll, we'll say with, with females, uh, three sisters, okay? Um, uh, middle, uh, oldest, and youngest that whether it was on the Waltons, of course, uh, f fictional writing or in your own life, that there is kind of uh, similarities. In other words, the oldest tends to be maybe more worldly. The middle child is more reserved and a kind of afraid and, you know, might have issues of uh, confidence or esteem issues. And uh, although that can apply to, to someone, I'm thinking a younger child where, you know, they, they 
had you know issues that uh, you know uh, uh, either bulimia or or uh, I'm blanking on the other one, but anyway, uh, things that obviously uh, stem from uh, problems inside themselves. You know, self self confidence. I think you find that that kind of like is common with a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, three sibling girls, or or I shouldn't generalize. <laughs> I I think that it can ch shift around a little bit yeah. because you know the Walton had the Waltons had three girls, and certainly my character Aaron was the middle, the, didn't have a sense of self felt like the baby was the baby and then Mary Ellen was strong tomboy and smart so Aaron kind of felt in the middle and she was nowhere yeah um here the youngest is a boy so with Danny he's you know but he's sort of like the baby and a little bit spoiled and you know so then when he has to take on this role of caring for the parents he it's hard for him in a way and yet you know there is a sense of honor of being the caretaker you know, whereas, and, and when you, I think more than anything in this story, it's not where they fall in the family. It's who stayed in the town where the parents and where they were raised. Right. Mary, and the other two kind of went off. Mary McDonough joining us for the hour here on Studio 411, the book The House on Honeysuckle Lane, marymcdonough.com, published by Kensington Books for more information. Uh, reading the book, I got the, the notion that the characters... Um, and, and I'm curious too how it how it uh, works from a, an author standpoint. Difficulty maintaining close relationships, but yet this book is set in present times. Whereas I would buy more into that if it was 1950, 1850, and beyond. But now everybody is so locked in that you know they tweet, they this, they do. You know, they, they, I didn't see that car coming because why? Because they're on on you know media, media, media that. It's funny that how today siblings would have that issue, you know, that, that they would have trouble, even though in, in Andy's case, she might have been out of the country, perhaps. She's like, she's in the ashram. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's in the ashram a lot and doesn't put a lot of value on that kind of communication. But, and I think the thing is that they do text each other and they do have email and, you know, that sort of stuff. But I think the closeness that the book is really about is, um, is how, how even with so much communication in our lives right now that sometimes we don't ever really get underneath that surface stuff. Exactly. We don't go underneath and below all of that. Oh yeah, oh, how are the kids? Great, I'm sending presents to you know, the niece and nephew for Christmas and I've got the birthday presents. It's all kind of the superficial stuff and when you have to get in and the book sort of like goes underneath it where they have to go, wow, why am I having this reaction? Because, you know, what is seemingly so nice and put together and it's a, a town and there's image and stuff. And they just have to kind of forced because of because of all of this to go deeper. Um, uh, how do you plan out your storylines? Now, I, I know the old fashioned way because uh, one author I had on recently you know, people used to map things out either on these giant boards, and now I understand there's software where people can kind of do that more as opposed to having their wall, you know, laced. Oh, wait, hold on. <laughs> Mary is going to tear the wall off. Like this? <laughs> oh, okay, very good. So you're you're an old school girl. There you go. There I Excellent. go. There's my, yeah. Excellent. But, but I will find out what that program is. I'll send it to you because uh, somebody was just telling me that it, it's revolutionary. It just it, makes it's a thing where it webs it for you yeah, and it puts yeah. it into the thing. But I'm a I'm a visual learner. I'm a that's why I said I put um I put photos around. I have them on the desk, and then I start out. I kind of start like I'm writing a term paper. Okay. When I first come up with the idea, you know, so we said, well, what what is this going to be? Same town, Christmas theme, and you know, I did. I was a primary caregiver for my mom. And I did lose both parents, and so I kind of write what I know. And I have a lot of friends who've gone through the same thing recently, and we were kind of sitting around and thought, well, what, you know, how can I write about this? And I heard a bunch of stories from other people, so they're not, this is not my story in here. It's a lot of people combined. And um, I thought, yeah, that is an interesting thing to go through. And so many of my friends are going through this that I thought, I'm just going to kind of write about that. So then I figure out who, who are they is who are who is the family and I kind of start an outline form and I just sort of say 
if they if it if you, what's the beginning the middle and the end and then and then I always go back to what is my purpose I always that's my big through line is what why am I writing this and what is my purpose in this I'm just amazed and again I'm kind of flipping these because both books are we're talking uh, one or two pages shy of about 400 pages I mean that is that is remarkable that you can even keep you know everything together you know it reminds me sometimes and i don't know if this ever happened on the waltons or any other programs that you might have done uh, episodic television where um uh, i'll use an example from mash colonel potter had a had a daughter early on though they said he had a son and a daughter but of course when you have different script writers and their hands are involved i don't think you know because they're not all on the payroll they're not there every every uh, script reading yeah. They might come in, like you said, and you might have uh, Rod Peterson or you might have Ellen to do a story or, yeah. or, or Richard Thomas might have directed something. Everyone's not going to remember. Do you find that that ever happens or that you catch yourself, wow, you know, I've, I'm repeating myself or worst case, I'm repeating something and it's not consistent with what I said time. before. <laughs> well, it happened on the Waltons, I said there. Yeah, so we would have, you know, there would be big fights with that. I mean, there's there's like a Bible that you have, and the Bible is the timeline and the people. And a lot of times I will put that on the wall. I will be like, here's this character analysis. And wait a minute, what year was that? Okay, so then she would be, and you, I have to just look at it to exactly. cross-reference it all the time. But yeah, you definitely go back and think, did I already establish the book? Did I establish the book? Oh my gosh, where did I? So I keep notes for myself about like, oh yeah, chapter four, I established that the book is brown and leather and it's worn and here's what it looks like and I just sort of keep notes that way because on the Waltons when like two things would happen when we came back to do the reunions the network sort of decided that they didn't want to have as many family members exactly. so Jason had a bunch of kids Ben and Cindy had a kid and it is like the thorn in our fans side they're like well what happened to baby Virginia all they did was say she died and then they got the other one and then where did he go and yeah. then where was John Curtis Mary Ellen and then Mary Ellen had a hysterectomy but somehow she magically got pregnant again after she remarried so there's those inconsistencies and then you know between the network people who come in and they say well we don't care nobody's going to remember those kids anyway mm. but I have to tell you our fans are very people, specific people and it's of still any show remember. Them as much as it bugged us when we yeah. went to film it yeah. and then one time we had a director come in and they wanted to, to make it easy to shoot. They wanted to change our places at the dinner table. We were like, no, 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 no. We all sit at a specific place. And like, well, but I don't want to do all these extra can No. And then, you know, so, and then another time we had someone come in and they wanted to put somebody in Will's chair after he had died. And Grandpa's chair stayed empty. Sure. Until Jonathan Frakes got to sit there, but it was years later, and he it was like he was the only person that was allowed to sit there. But they want to move you around. He's like, no, that's not how it works. Sure, and, so. I, and I have to mention Jonathan Franks, who was really just Jonathan Franks' actor, later became, and I'm forgetting the character, but later became a big star on Star Trek: Next Generation. Number one. He was number one. Number one, one and is now a fellow writer, as such as yourself, correct? Because he's he's a best-selling author as well. He's multi-talented yeah. and my favorite love interest ever. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh-oh, I dug That's too deep, fun. folks. Look out. Get, get Clear that chair from the table. There we go. That's uh, right. He got to sit there. He was special. <laughs> he still is. Uh, Woodville he's Junk. He's a director. I mean, he does everything. Yes. Oh, yeah. And he's married to someone famous, and I'm, I'm just blanking. Jeannie Francis. Jeannie Francis. That's right. There you go. From General Hospital. See this? Yeah. Uh, they, uh, Woodville uh, Junction is a town that's mentioned in the book, and I had this discussion with uh, another author recently where I happen to mention off-air uh, uh, towns because it reminded me of one called Whitewater Junction, Vermont. And the person, ah. and the person goes, so, you know, and they had, like yourself, sounds like you'd never heard of it. But they go, oh, I could, I could see them, their mind uh, writing it down like, you know, oh, my God, that's a great, great town <laughs> for a book, you know, for a storyline. Do you find that from your time in Virginia or maybe from Colorado or time spent in California that uh, topics or towns come to you or names of characters and you, you write it down? And, you know, I do. Okay. I do. It's one of the things I put into notes. Um, 
I was, you know, or just tiny things that I noticed. I was sitting in a cafe, um, and I just, this woman was so distinctive and, and she knew everyone was looking at her, but she didn't let off, you know, but she was, and she was so, she just, she drank her, her tea in a certain way and she squeezed her lemon and, and I just thought, oh my gosh, that woman, she knows everybody's watching. And I, and I just was like fascinated with this. So I took my phone and I was like, as she sat at the, you know, <laughs> she sucked every juice out of that little piece yeah. of, you know, lime and, you know, it, it was just so fun. She's dictating but, to herself here, I'm telling you. <laughs> I was like, yes. And I just, you know, like, I don't know where I'll ever use it, but, but I will. And, and when I was, um, when I, after finishing or in kind of the middle of before big edits, um, on how they cycle and I, I had gone through a lot of small towns in Virginia and I took a lot of pictures of front porches and I sent them to Kensington and I said, these are small town sure. houses with porches and they're decorated for different holidays and I got them around Christmas and I and so I just and so I, I it doesn't really have anything to do with it but I love just having all of those sure. pictures and those visuals. We have some in Connecticut although I sometimes I think not as many as we used to have but that could be said of any of any town or state but the kind where it's you know uh, in the front and then the ones that even curl around the side you know and, and I love a wraparound porch. Right but where the wraparound is it's some house has one. Yeah where the wraparound is, it's almost got kind of a circular, like a, a semi-circle effect, and then mm -hmm. it goes there, and so people can kind of like go there, and of course with the walls, you need all the room you can get. So. Well, and I, and I think the reason I'm drawn to that probably too is because the Waltons had a front porch with a swing and chairs, and we did, there was a lot happening out there, whether Grandma and I out there were shucking peas, and so I think I'm just, I'm, I'm drawn to the area and I I've, I've, haven't had a house that has a wraparound front porch yet. Yeah, yes, yes. There's yeah, time, Larry. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Uh, one thing uh, in Chapter 5, uh, there was a mention of their father, uh, uh, obviously recalling their late father. And I was taken aback to uh, uh, my, my late first father-in-law because there was a quote about resting his eyes while reading the paper. And right away I was taken to uh, my, my late first father-in-law, who wasn't so much the paper, it would be the TV would be on. And we'd all be like, let's, let's, we want to change this channel. We want to watch the ball game, whatever. And as soon as someone changed it, it would instantly wake up like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm watching it, you know, and so I put it back, you know. So, and, and I think in my... Uh, middle age I think I'm starting to do the same thing so I don't know yes. my dad usually could not fall asleep unless he was watching television it just would put him out and he was so busy all the time so I think there's that moment of like how do you I'm just resting my eyes yeah exactly just resting the <laughs> eyes cat nap anything it, more than than 15 or 20 minutes and it ruins your day <laughs> <laughs> Now, how many uh, uh, books, or is it kind of open-ended at this point in, in this, uh, we'll call it uh, Oliver's Well series, how many uh, are you kind of uh, storyboarding? Because again, it sounds like you have aspirations even to take it to another level. And I know- Yeah, and I have a lot of other books that, I'm, that I want to write as well. And some of them may be in the Oliver's Well series, and some of them may not be. Um, there's, and right now we have no no plans right now we're in talks about a possible you know third book but there's nothing in stone right now these first two were just sort of you know put out there like we'll do this one and that one but there are other characters within the town now that i kind of love and you know the sort of the eccentric wealthy woman who has the house i have a storyline for her and i a love story and you know and to put that together and and I, I envision Oliver's Well as a television series. I know, sort of I know there was some talk to... about movies and stuff, but movies is such a, you know, such a big, big, uh, you know, you have to get financing and everything. I'm sure you do with TV, but it's just so much work into this one project, whereas with a TV series. But w how would you handle that? I mean, I don't even know how Earl would handle it. He did the movie, the TV movie, then the series came on. Mm -hmm. Like many, the first year, two, three, whatever, it depends on the individual. They're very active, and then they kind of uh, acquiesce to a stable of writers. Uh, you, you know, your family wouldn't see you because you'd be, I know you've got a lot of ideas up on the ceiling there, but, I mean, 
if, if I said to you, okay, in two months it's gonna go to series, you're gonna extract maybe eight or 10 or 12 uh, episodes from these two books, hypothetically. Right. But then you know, all of a sudden, boy, you're gonna be looking in that shoebox at those notes and post-it notes and, you know. <laughs> well, but also I think, I mean, for me, um, I see the town, and so I, I sort of look at it as so many people have said to me, you know, there, we wish that there was a show like the Waltons now. There'll never be another one um, because it was own, its own particular time. But I have so many people say there are no good shows on. There's nothing decent to watch anymore. And if I had a quarter for every time somebody said that to me. So when I went to write the Oliver's Well series, I really thought about what everybody who had come to my lessons from the mountain memoir book signings had said to me. And I thought, you know, maybe there is a place for people to read books that are about family. And, and there's no, I always say there's no sex, drugs, or rock and roll in them. <laughs> but then I thought, well, maybe there might be a place for, you know, like a Hallmark or an inspiration channel to kind of have either movies of the week or a town, you know, and, and not that we wouldn't deal with any current day issues, right. you know, but it's just about a community of people getting along. And I think that that is something that people are missing so much in this country. So whether it becomes a series called Oliver's Well or not, I have great ideas for how, you know, you can talk about community and family and people coming together. And it's not that you have to live on a farm, but I mean, I think, I just think, look at the way, the state of where our country is right now. I think that there's a huge chasm and I think people are really going back and I have people who are third and fourth generations who are watching the Waltons with their grandkids and they watched it with their grandparents. And there's some kind of through line about family is what you make it. And they're having a sense of community is a great sense of strength. And I think people don't feel that so much right now. Exactly. So, you know, an idea I had, and again, I don't know, I don't know the gentleman. I don't know that you know him, uh, Dick Wolf, who's the guy that has done the um, Law and Order series and, and yeah. countless other you know, installments. But again, I, I was thinking, boy, they'd be a good guy to talk to because what they do, he and his people, they draw stories, in this case, crime stories, police mm -hmm. stories from the headlines. My point to you is to do, let's say, an Oliver's Well or any type of series that would be an inspiration, Hallmark, Lifetime type show, you can do the same thing. There are so many good things out there. You just have to mine, and then obviously with your imagination and again, using it as an inspiration, not telling it verbatim as it happened. I think those quote good news stories are out there. It's just that it's easier to write about you know the the, the sex, drugs, and I like rock and roll, so I'm not going to diss that. <laughs> well, you know, and when I when I went to do lessons from the mountain, um, it was very hard to get it published because as a former child star, people just, you know, there are a lot of us who have not, not made it and who are dead or have had some serious issues. And I took, you know, I took some really tough things that happened to me in my life and I ended up going and becoming an advocate for women's health issues and lupus mm -hmm. and the whole breast implant body image issue. And I went to Washington DC and I became a citizen activist. So part of the book talks about that. And I actually had people, publishers reject the book because I wasn't in rehab and I hadn't slept with any rock stars. And yeah. that's, you know, and they, and one of them actually said, but she actually did something positive. Nobody <clears throat> wants to read that. Of course, amazing, no one wants it? to know that. Amazing. They want to see her fall down and crash and burn and, yeah. you know, and I thought, wait a minute, I don't know if that's really true. May she rest in peace, but not all stories end like Dana Plato and so many yeah. other unfortunates in your business. And again, just in normal life, not celebrities. Most of us uh, end up, most yeah. former child performers end sure. up yeah. with some, you know, and not that I didn't have mine, but I was really lucky. I had two families. I had my own McDonough family and I had my Walton family and some really great women in my life and role models and Ellen, between Ellen Corby and Michael Learned and all the people that, the, you know, I had six mothers, you know, because yeah. I had every kid on the show had a mom that was a role model. So I was lucky. There's a, a quote that is attributed to Emma in the book. And of course, uh, Emma got it from Mary because Mary wrote the book. <laughs> There is a danger of success, losing the rest of your life in the process. Do you find that that's something that either 
did happen or do you worry that it could happen to you if, for instance, successful as you are, but of course with you know, more, more fame and more uh, success to come, do you kind of like heed your own words there and say, you know, put them in the back of my head? I think I wrote it as a, a caution. Yeah. It's a cautionary tale because I have had that kind of success and certainly had my own pitfalls from it. You know, I had difficult moments that came from it. So, I, and I and I do think about that. I think of if I hadn't dealt with all of my uh, my emotions, my eating stuff, my body image stuff, and I had launched into being the career that inc- you know successful person that I wanted to be, I don't know that I would have made it. I think it would have been more confusing. So I think about that in the back of my mind, like what's worth it, you know, and is losing yourself, you know, and certainly there is always that part of me that wants to have that success. You know, I wanted to be on movie posters, not a poster girl for a disease. Right. You know? exactly. <laughs> it was sort of not my, my plan, but I don't know what would have happened to me had I gone that path. And now I have a very lovely life. I have great kids and a great husband and, and I'm, I feel very blessed and lucky. And, and that may, with all the confusion, had I not been able to sort that out, I may have ended up Exactly. As to statistics, like yeah. most of our former child performers. My my belief in life, uh, again, one of them was, you know, uh, uh, never say never, but the other one is kind of like, I really believe in that. I call it the it's a wonderful life kind of sy- syndrome. If the slightest thing would have been different, I would not have met in this individual. I would not have done this. I wouldn't be here talking to you, whatever, you know, good, bad, or indifferent those things would be altered and I think people don't realize that that that's just a movie just a movie no it's, it's more it's more than that but again every you know people will it's sit true, and watch no. something or read this book uh, uh, the house on honeysuckle lane and everybody will take something different from it that's cool but then when something is so obvious and then only 30 percent of the people see it that's that's troubling you know and, yeah. And, you know. Well, and there are people who won't like some of the characters. So they're like, "Why? He, he, she's just a brat, or he's just selfish, or why can't they get along? Like, what's going on?" But it, but it happens. Sure. It Mary, happens in life. Mary McDonough joining us for the uh, remaining few moments here on Studio Four One One. The book, The House on Honeysuckle Lane, Kensington Books, also the uh, first in the series, One Year. Uh, for more information on Mary and uh, all her uh, stuff, as we say, is so busy, it's more than, more than we have time. It would take me an hour just to tell you the things she does. Just to take my call took, took more than an hour, folks, okay? But thank you, Karen Orbach, <laughs> for, <the, laughs> for, for that and more. And she'll even have this as a blog. Like, yes, annoying little man had me on his show today. But anyway, no. www.marymcdonough.com. In our remaining moments, uh, uh, you've been really great about touching on uh, some of the Walton stuff. Uh, you've mentioned her a few times. Uh, Ellen Corby, obviously with your young children back in the day and, and with you as a young and young adult, uh, tremendous influencer person in your life, even after the show ended. Oh, absolutely. Well, she and my daughter were born a couple of days apart, so we always used to go and celebrate their birthdays. And she always used to talk about that they were Gemini's, so it was, you know, very, that they're special. <laughs> it's schizophrenic, go. I would say. <laughs> but, um, but Ellen was, but people don't know about her, is that she was very kind of like, you know, the Andy. She, she was, you know, went to India. She studied yoga. She had a new age, you know, like Buddhist lifestyle and understanding. And I remember one time, you know, you have all of this, you know, creative visualization and, you know, put it out there and think it and it will come and vision boards and all these things. Ellen Corby taught me that when I was a kid and she made me hold her Emmy and she's like, I want you to really feel this and I want you to visualize yourself as winning one one day. And so, you know, all of this, you know, things that, you know, everybody's talking about now, Ellen was doing it a long time ago. So she was an incredible sure. woman strong, gifted, spiritual, and, um, and tough. And she directed a couple, at least two that I know of, episodes of The Waltons, which even for that time, again, that was like being in a class with like Ida Lupino. She wrote two episodes. She, oh, she wrote, I thought she directed. No, okay, my bad. So I thought she was going to say, I, but she still was Her in that. Episode, yeah, yeah, like Ida Lupino. When I was in college, I took a film course, and Ida Lupino was, was later married to Howard Duff. 
a divorce, kind of like a uh, Brangelina type deal. But anyway, it was, uh, you know, very much into, you know, being uh, this kind of B-movie director, but would never get a shot like some of the women today because, you know, oh, we all know why. And, and But still, yeah. whatever she did, did a great work. And, and Ellen uh, directed or uh, wrote, rather, a couple of episodes. I don't know why I thought she directed, well, she, too. She wrote a book, too. She wrote a book as well. And, and so, yeah. <clears throat> amazing, amazing. Now, we talked uh, earlier uh, of off-air. How do you like traveling the country promoting uh, the book? And, of course, folks can go to Mary's website to uh, uh, obtain any uh, updated information as, as the uh, days and months go by. But uh, you, you do a lot of traveling, which is great. Yeah, I do a lot of public speaking. Um, I'm a certified life coach, so I do a lot of speaking about my own issues and overcoming and hopefully inspirational. And so I get to incorporate that and go speak to you know, young girls and boys about their self-esteem. And, and um, I'm lucky that way because I'll do book signings at the same time. And I, I love meeting people, um, and people always say, oh, don't you ever get tired of hearing about the Waltons? Well, and I never do. Everybody has such a personal, intimate story about how the show or my books or whatever touched their lives. Like, who would ever get sick of that, right? But that goes back to, like, something you talked about in the book, is that each person, whether it would be me or my camera person or my director, if they met you, and said, I remember the show, they're going to have not only different likes or maybe dislikes even, but how it affected them differently. So you're never going to get the same answer. I mean, unless it's yeah. like, you know. And when people write reviews and they go, I hate that guy. Why did he do that? Or she's so tough. Nobody would ever really be like that. It's like, well, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> there's a little Ellen Corby and Mary Bernadette in, in one year. Exactly. And so there are, but and and that at least gets people talking because then you at least know that you made someone angry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it had a reaction, right? Oh and my goodness! My goodness! The letters will be flowing in uh, about that last comment. No, they won't. But anyway, <laughs> it uh, makes people think, and that's that's rewarding. Like yeah. I said, if people think or it hits them and they have some emotion, it's all worth it. There you go. And it was well worth having Mary join us. Well worth the uh, the the work and the. Uh, Cajoling and, so good, Larry. and sorry, sorry, Karen, sorry. Karen Orbach, thank you so much. You have no idea. The check is in the mail, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> Mary McDonough, the house on Honeysuckle Lane. Uh, uh, for more information, uh, www.marymcdonough.com. Uh, my goodness, uh, again, it, it just uh, a pleasure to have you. I have so many more questions, so you will have to come back on. By the way, uh, your friend Judy Norton says hello. So I talked oh, to I talked sister. to her. Yes, your TV sis. So anyway, hang there with us. And again, thank you for coming and uh, enjoy your dinner tonight. I'm not invited, but I'm I'm not close enough to go. To <laughs> now I need to go be a wife and a mom. So yes. I'm sorry, Larry. There you go. <laughs> All right. While we uh, we uh, bid Mary farewell, we thank you for joining us on this episode of Studio 411. We hope you enjoyed the program, and we certainly. Uh, uh, did and uh, look forward to seeing you folks again next time on Studio 411. Take care. Have a great week.